Are you one of the people that have been asking me when I'm going to release the PCB schematics for the PCB version of our tiny basic computer system? Well, today you're in luck as we're going to build our revision 2 PCB version. Stay with us. This video series is funded in part by our kind backers on Patreon. Join today from just $3 per month and gain access to exclusive video and project related downloadable content. Visit patreon.com slash wifi sheep. Links are in the description to this video. Hello, how are you doing? And a warm welcome to part seven of the Tiny Basic Computers project series right here on youtube.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep with me, Tom. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, just to bring you up to speed, I have just been doing two shows, the first shows of, well, since the pandemic started, and the main project content I've been taking has been Tiny Basic Computers. So a huge thank you if you came to either the Preston Make Fest or most recently the Stafford Raspberry Pi Jam. Uh, it was great to meet up with you, and it was amazing to actually meet some people who had actually gone and built their own Tiny Basic systems. Again, all of them were asking me, when is the PCBs going to be available? Well, if you remember, the first PCBs we did, Revision 1, had a few issues, and that was my fault. Uh, luckily, and thankfully, due to our partners at PCBGoGo.com, I have a new Revision 2 PCB, and that's what we're going to build today. The plan is, if you want to download and order your own clones of these PCBs from PCBGoGo, then stay tuned to this video. I'm going to run through the whole process of how this works and how you can get hold of your own boards. So first of all, you're going to need the brand new Revision 2 PCB, and you can get this courtesy of our partners at PCBGoGo.com. First, head over to patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep and click to join the $3 or £2 general support and downloads tier. Sign up or register a new account with Patreon. Payment details will also be required. Patreon is a subscription-based service. Payments will be taken when you join the tier and at the beginning of each following month. You can cancel at any time. Your payments here help support the running costs of Wi-Fi Sheep and are always greatly appreciated. Once joined, look for the Tiny Basic Computers Toolkit post and download the attached zip file. Extract this file and open the toolkit folder. Inside, look for the PCB R2 folder. Later revisions might have a larger number, such as R3. Inside, you will find a text file containing the bill of parts required to build this PCB version and a second zip file called something like tbc-r2gerber.zip. You do not need to unzip this file, just set it aside for the moment. Next, head over to pcbgogo.com or click the affiliate link in the description of this video. If not done so already, log in or sign up for a new account. Once signed in, click the PCB Instant Quote tab. On the right side of the page, click the Online Gerber Viewer button. This will load an in-browser virtual viewer allowing you to check your downloaded zip file. Simply drag the TCBR2 Gerber zip file into the virtual viewer window space. In a few seconds, you should see a 3D render of the Tiny Basic Computer's PCB. The front silkscreen text should read R2 or later, with a date no earlier than 621. Once you're happy the file is being read correctly, the main ordering details can be added by clicking the back button on your browser or re-clicking the PCB Instant Quote tab. Thanks to the way PCBGoGo is set up, most details can be left as default. However, some changes are required. First, the PCB size needs to be added, which is 
86.36 millimeters by 63.50 millimeters. Please note the PCB sizing is in metric millimeters and not imperial inches. Next is the required quantity, the minimum of which is five pieces. All other settings can be left as is, apart from the surface finish, which I recommend switching to HASL lead free, as most European countries restrict the use of lead in products. Colours of the PCP solder mask and silk screen can also be changed, but additional charges will be added to the end unit price if switching from the default green and white. Once you're happy with the settings, click the calculate button at the bottom of the page. A price will appear on the top right with the PCB price, normally just five US dollars if using the settings shown. Below, set your home country and preferred shipping agent. For me here in the United Kingdom, I found the FedEx IP offered slightly cheaper shipping although cost and shipping times will vary depending on where you are in the world. Once done, click to add to basket. Next, re-upload the Gerber file from the Patreon toolkit by clicking the Add Gerber file button. Once uploaded, click the red Submit your PCB file button. PCB GoGo engineers will test your upload before emailing you with a pass and request for payment. This process may take up to 24 hours. Once passed, payment will be required. Click proceed to checkout and enter your payment details and shipping address. And depending on where you are in the world, normally the lead time of about two weeks, you should get a parcel, something like this in the post from PCB GoGo. And inside will be five brand new PCBs. I've got two of them here. And what's great about a minimum order being five is that you've got a spare or a number of spares if you want to build more than one unit or if something goes wrong and you want to start again. So that's always great. And these PCBs are fantastic quality. So that is how you get hold of the revision two PCB needed for this project. So once we've got our PCB, the first thing we want to do is a quick continuity voltage check. So I've got my meter on continuity mode. That means that when the two probes touch each other, it makes a beep. And I'm just gonna go over the PCB now and just check that the voltages, that's the five volts and the ground are in the right place. So let's do uh, five volts for starters. So the red is the plus, and I'll just hold that over a five volts on the board. So the, up here, we've got a five volts mark. So I'll just pop that probe in there. And I'll just see if I start touching around on the board so we can find five volts elsewhere where it should be. That's five volts there, which is correct. That's correct. Yeah, that's looking okay. And we do the same with ground. So also G ground, which is labeled as G and D. And there'll be a lot more grounds than there will be That's looking okay. So I haven't tested all the contact points, but that's enough to tell me that there isn't anything incorrect and there's no voltages in the wrong place. So it does mean if hypothetically there is still something wrong with this board, we're not going to blow up any major components by trying to wire it up. However, I honestly feel with revision two, I think everything should be absolutely fine. So that's looking great to start with. So the next thing you need to do is to get your Arduinos sorted out. So you're going to need a Arduino Nano, which will be for the basic interpreter. And for this build, we also use an Atmega 328P here. So I've shown in multiple videos how to flash these. These obviously you just plug the USB in and you flash using Xloader, the uh, basic interpreter, and then the serial terminal. If you're gonna use this chip, which you need to for these PCBs, then you need to get something like a Arduino Uno and you pop the chip in. This one has been modded to have a ZIF socket. I've done a video all about how this works. Pop the chip in 
and then you attach that via USB and you flash it exactly the same way you would the Nano. Now, if you want to make sure these are working correctly, this is where having a solderless breadboard version of the system comes in very useful because you can just swap out the chips to test that the 328P and the Nano are working correctly. These aren't flashed and just to save time in this video, I'm actually gonna lift the chip and the board off this breadboard and these are the ones we'll use for the PCB. Again, it's just to save time uh, during this build, but you would probably go ahead and flash new ones, which I will do later on. So we've now got two known good chips, so we know both of these work. Now with the 3 to 8 ps you normally buy them and you can get them very cheaply as part of a little kit. By the way, a bill of parts for what you need to buy will be included with the PCB Gerber files. I'm not going to give links on here or show you exactly where to buy things because prices change all over the world and links change as well. So I'll just give you the part names and you can search them for yourself. But basically you normally can buy a 3 to 8 p a chip holder, and you get the 16, oops, 16 megahertz clock crystal, and you get two, now I can't remember these are microfarad or picofarad, but I will check that, uh, but they're labeled 22 uh, ceramic disc capacitors, and they're very small, and normally you get this little pack, and that's all you need to make this chip run, and these parts fit into our board. You don't need to use the chip holder, I highly recommend you do and I will be using that on my build today. However, I won't be socketing this Nano. So on the old version of the PCB, which I have here, I actually socketed this board so it will come out. However, I'm now happy that this board can be permanently fixed onto the PCB. So it's going to slot straight in and we'll solder it straight through. With Nanos, I've always bought the ones with the pre-soldered header because they're mainly for using with the solderless breadboards. However, as we're soldering, you can save yourself a bit of money and you could buy the ones that aren't soldered with the header. Pick yourself up some header, which you'll need anyway, and you can actually put your own, if you like, legs on the Arduinos. So you can save yourself a little bit of money, although it is more time consuming. Now, I'll just pop these bits to the side. Okay, so I always start with the resistors. And we need four 1K resistors. And we also need one 470 ohm resistor. Now, I know it's a bit annoying that you only need the one resistor, 470 ohm, because you can only buy them in packs. Um, so I've got a pack here. Another thing to watch, actually, is that when you're buying resistors, make sure you're buying the quarter watt ones, not the half watt because they're actually much bigger. Now they will fit, but you'll have to sort of uh, squeeze them into the holes. Uh, they are a little bit too big. Uh, you can actually see here on camera, if you see the size difference. So do make sure you actually get the smaller ones uh, where possible. Okay, so let's put the one 470 in because every other resistor on this board is gonna be a 1K. So we'll just bend the legs by hand. It doesn't matter which way around these go, they just have to go into the correct port and on or spacing rather. And our new board, the 470 ohm goes onto resistor 3 or R3, so it's going to go in this space here. Once the resistor's through, we can just bend the legs out the other side. So it's not going to go anywhere. And we'll get that soldered on. So with all the soldering, what I tend to use is this alcohol-based uh, flux, which is Topnik RF800, which I've always said is quite potent. But you can just paint a little bit on each side. It's all you need. Make sure you put the lid back on. The amount of times I've spilt this stuff is ridiculous. A little bit of thin core solder. It needs to be thin core solder, not plumber solder. Soldering iron nicely heated up. There we go. Again, I can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> you get a better view on camera than I do in real life. So just bear that in mind. And then once we're happy that that is in, it's a little bit wonky, but it's okay. We can just snip off 
the legs. And that's on. If we're not happy, if it's a little bit wonky, which that one is, can just very carefully pair of pliers and you just straighten that up. That's no problem at all. So I'm just going to now repeat this using the 1K resistors and I'm going to populate all the R numbered spaces. There is an additional resistor now on this version which needs to go in. All resistors need to go in. So I'm just going to do that now and we'll uh, jump cut to when I've done. Okay, so about five minutes later and we've got all five resistors now wired onto the board, all soldered on. All five are needed for this computer. Next, we're going to put the clock or the crystal clock uh, on. So this is a can marked as 16.000, so it's 16 megahertz. And I should say crystal oscillator actually. And it goes here at Y1 doesn't really matter which way around it goes, but it's kind of nice if you've got it with at least the 16 the correct way around. Just cosmetically looks nicer. And I'll go through like that. Turn the board over. Spread the legs out again. And then we'll solder that on. The same way we've been soldering everything else. And once we're done, we'll just clip the legs. So that's the can now in place. I think next we should probably need to do the chip holder. So chip holders have a notch. The notch needs to point the same way as the notch here in the silk screen. So the chip holder is going to go in that way around. And it may just need some persuading on the legs. This is the leg there, it's just a little bit bent. So I'm just straighten that out. Pair of pliers just to straighten the legs so we have a chance of getting this into the holes in the socket. Try that. There we go. Just make sure all the legs are successfully through all the holes, which they are. Keep make sure that stays flush. And at this point, you may just need to add something just behind, like on the side here, just to stop the board tilting too much. It starts to get a little bit wobbly and fiddly. Sometimes just using like a small ball of blue tack, just to hold the board on that side, stop it rocking. There we are. And then just again with the flux, just going to paint all the way down all the pins. There we are. Now with the soldering, we want to be very careful how we do this. We don't want to bridge pins. So it's important not to use too much solder and to make sure the soldering iron is nice and hot. So we'll start with one pin in the top corner. I just had a bit of muck on the end of my uh, soldering iron. It's making it difficult. So I've just used a bit of damp sponge just for some water, just to, uh, that's better, Let's see what we're doing now. So there's no rush, take your time with this. This is a little bit tricky. It's even worse when you uh, can't actually see what you're doing properly because you're off camera. So you'll do a much neater job than this than I will. You can already see like a ball of solder building up on top of the iron. So before we add any more, see if we can just get that onto some of these pins. If it's sort of struggling slightly to solder, you may need to add a little bit more flux. But as I've always said when I do these projects, I will off camera just make sure that all these joints are actually correctly soldered. Because it's very difficult for me to see that everything is soldered correctly. And again, just take your time and go over things again if you need to. That's looking all right. I think that'll probably be okay. But as you can see, it takes a little bit of time, especially with some of the large things, just to get it right. Um, unfortunately, not quite flat, but I think it'll be okay. Okay, so next we'll add the USB. Now on this board, the USB has been brought forward. So if I show you on the previous PCB, see how the whole USB sat 
sort of onto the board. Well, I've changed that design slightly. So the P the uh, USB now, you pop that in there, see how it now overhangs? And so that's more useful for mounting this board into a project box or a case, because you don't want this flush with the end of the PCB. You may want to build a mount or something around it for a case. So we'll put the um, USB on next. Very, very simple. It actually went straight in. There's the pins. You've got two securing on the ground as well. So all, the, all uh, four, five, six need to be done. Again, if the board's a little bit wobbly, piece of blue tack just on the other side, just to try and stable a little bit. There we go. Okay, so that's the USB on. Um, now then, probably the best thing to do next will be the numerous headers that are required. So, on the board, we've got a number of jumpers, which some are needed, some aren't. And we also have headers here for the GPIO, and we also have headers here for accessing the serial and voltages. Now, on the previous board, I'll show you here, the GPIO header, I had straight pins going upwards. However, I'm thinking more about this being mounted inside something, and I probably want to be able to connect this way. So I went and sourced these 90 degree right angle bent pin header, and I'm going to mount that into here. And we'll probably do that as the next thing we do. So again, need to try and make sure we get this straight as we can. It's always going to get more fiddly the more things we add, you see. So, um, yes, that's going to be a tricky one to do. Sometimes it may be that you just want to try and, without mounting the blue tack, to pop a bit of blue tack just on the back, just to keep the thing straight and as level as you can. There we go. Again, with everything else, we'll flux up. Try not to make a mess. This stuff, by the way, is corrosive, so you don't really want to be doing what I've just done and splattering all over the place. Just so we get this secure, because we can't leave blue tag underneath, because it will get all icky and mounty. We'll just secure a pin here. Uh, we'll secure a pin over here. So the header can't move. We'll get the blue tag off so it doesn't mount anymore. And then we can... Like that, and then we can actually solder everything else, knowing that this pin header isn't going to drop or move again on us. There we go. Okay, excellent. So that's our pin header on. Just take the blue tack off. That's looking relatively straight as well. That's fantastic. So the next thing we'll do is we'll do the top pin header piece here. Now. I don't have a perfect piece that fits, but you'll need this sort of double straight pin header. So we'll go that way around. And we just need to take a pair of snips, we just need to cut a little bit off to make sure it fits correctly. There we go. And now we can drop that through making sure it stays relatively straight and we'll solder that on as well so we just did the two corners as before we'll just make sure that is on relatively straight that looks fine actually and again we just use a piece of blue tack just to support the board in that corner Once you get the hang of this, it's actually not difficult to do at all. We do have some remaining pin headers, and these are either three-way or two-way headers. And I've got some little header pieces here which we can cut up. But most of them, we're going to need the single header like this, and we'll have to cut it uh, to fit what we want. So first of all, we've got a three-way header. Let's have a look. Three-way header here. So I'm going to cut this piece to make a two and a three. There we go. 
This three-way header here is needed if you want any sound because it selects which way the sound is channeled, either to the buzzer or out to the external monitor. So we'll put that one in next. Okay, and the remainders uh, required. Uh, Talolite, there's another free one we need there, which is new for this board, part of the uh, video circuit, not present on the previous board. So, again, we'll just do exactly, exactly the same thing. This one is also required if you want any video out of your system, so we'll put that in there. Do exactly the same thing as we did before. I'll just finish off the other two pins. There we go. So with the remaining headers, there's actually only one more that you need. So there's JP1, JP4 and JP5 labelled here on the board. You actually only need a two-way header in JP1. That's because that's the serial link that's going to connect the main CPU side to the video terminal side. These other two, JP4, JP5, aren't actually used at the moment. So I'm not going to populate these today. But in possible later revisions of the Tiny Basic Computers firmware, these may be required. But for version 3, if you're using version 3 alpha, uh, you don't need to populate these two pins. So we're just going to put JP1 as a two-way header. This is necessary. So as you can see, the build now really is coming along nicely. Uh, next, we'll put the reset switch in. And I have a little bag of reset switches here. Now, because I'm thinking about mounting this into um, another case or something at a later date, I may end up having to take the reset switch back out to move it to another location. But right now, today, that's not the problem. We do need the reset switch to test the um, system. So the reset switch is here. It's moved slightly from the previous PCB, but it's still in roughly the same place. And let's just see if we can... Again, you might need to just tweak the legs. Slightly just to get this to go in. By the way, the reset switches, if you get the correct ones, they can only go in one way. As with everything else, we'll just tap that in very quickly. Again, this might be coming back out again, this switch. Yep, that'll do for now. Now, you would at this point probably think about putting the LED in, and the LED needs to go with the long leg, which is the plus on this side against the resistor. Um, at least I think that's right. <laughs> yes, because it grounds this side. Uh, because I do want to mount this, I'm going to use a different type of LED, which means I'm not going to put the LED into circuit at the moment. That's fine, the LED is just the power LED to really indicate that things running, it's not necessarily part of it. So we're, we're nearly getting there. Um, I think the next thing to do is probably to put our main Arduino nano board in. So you need a board that's already got the header on. And this may take a little bit of adjustment to fit properly. I'm not going to use any um, sockets there we go, just a little bit of persuasion, or quite a bit of persuasion needed. If it floats a little bit, that's fine actually, because you don't want too much pin header through the other side, so you can get it relatively straight. Uh, if it sits a little bit high, that's fine actually. There we go, it worked. I um, should also point out, very, very important, make sure that you've actually got your nano to crit around its USB socket facing out the back of the unit opposite to where the GPIO is. If the USB is over here, you've got the board the wrong way around. Hate to be able to have soldered all that in and then realise you've got the board in the wrong way. So, um, But no, that's looking great. So next, let's have a look at the capacitors. Now, this board requires three. Two, which I already showed you earlier, are from the 
uh, 328p kit, which are these ceramic disc capacitors, these little orange discs. And we also use one electrolytic capacitor. These little ones that look like batteries. Now, the ceramic disc capacitors, it doesn't really matter which way around they go in because there's no positive and negative. However, these electrolytics are what we call polarised, so they have to go in a certain way. An electrolytic capacitor, if I can just show you, has a stripe. And the stripe here denotes the negative or the minus. So the other leg is the positive. And the spacing for this is called C1, and it's just here on the board. And positive is the square hole. So the capacitor wants to go in this way round. Make sure it goes all the way down so it's touching the base of the PCB. And you want to make sure the stripe is facing away out towards the nearest edge. There we go. And then as with everything else we do, we'll get some flux and we'll just solder that on. So the final two capacitors need to go here and here. They're labelled C2, C3, and these are the ceramic orange disc capacitors. As I just said, no need to put these in any particular way. They just both need to go in these two, and they're attached to the timing circuit with the crystal. So they are needed in order to run the uh, video terminal at the correct 16 megahertz. So again, we'll try and get these straight, but if they're not straight, it's not the end of the world. Okay, and um, yeah, they're a little bit wonky, but they're all right, they're in and they'll work, which is the main thing. So, uh, final component I want to fit is a buzzer and a little packet here. I was using a five volt buzzer, but it sounded a little bit quiet. So I opted to switch to three volt buzzers instead or 3.3 volt and these like the capacitor have to go in a certain way. They're labelled with a plus, which you might just be able to see there. If I catch the light correctly. There you go, little plus. And there's a plus denoted here on the PCB. So also make sure the pins are straight. And the buzzer. Should sit in like that flush. And that pretty much is all the parts I want to fit apart from the sound and video out. Now on the previous version we use these B and C connectors and that's still the type of connector actually required. To use BNCs you need an adapter which clips over the top and then that adapter allows you to plug your analog RCA type socket in because this is an analog out remember. Um, that's okay but some people found this a little bit cumbersome and you do need to have two adapters especially if you want to use sound as well. So because I want to potentially mount this separately I may have it that the case may be bigger than the board and so the video needs to be somewhere else. I have here a little uh, standard RCA twin I think it's a part of the stereo uh, component. Uh, and we can wire this up to these pins and then have this as a separate floating part. So to do that, I've got some wire and I'm going to cut three lengths to the same length. And then we're just going to wire it up manually uh, just to see how it works really. So this is the RCA jack and I've now got three pieces of prepared wire. Uh, we'll use the black for video. So what I'm going to do is, if I get this right, I'm going to attach the end of this wire into the hole here. And I'm just going to bend it around. So it just holds on like so. I'll do the same on the red. Now I'm actually using single core wire here, which is perhaps not the best to use. It's a little bit um, stiff, but it'll do. So with those on, I want to just put plenty of flux. And then we'll just a bit of solder. So audio will be on red. 
and the video will be on yellow. And I've got the black here, which will act as the ground. Now both can have a common ground, but just for now we're going to put the black onto this lower lug on the video side. So something a bit like that. So that's now on there. So the video side would now work. The audio side, however, isn't connected. Now, instead of running a separate uh, ground, what I might just do is just hop a piece of cable from this top lug to this top lug. Okay, so I've created this little piece of cable and I've just tinned the ends with some solder. So I'm just gonna tap this. onto there. And this way it gets a little bit fiddly. And then I'm just going to manually just weave the other bit of the cable or wire through. I just need to pull this tab back. There we go. There we go. So that's now bridged between the two just on the ground. So we only have to use one ground lead for both sound and video. Hopefully I won't regret doing that. I think it'll be all right, but uh, we'll see how that goes. So that's now our RCA uh, plate fitted up. And I'll just show you now how to attach this onto the PCB. The PCB has two sockets here, which are meant to be BNC connectors. This is video, this is audio. These two plates, and these two holes here are actually ground. They're all connected together. The video signal is here and the sound signal is here. So if I connected, for example, this yellow cable just to there, that would work fine. And then the same with the black, which is ground, could just be actually connected to anywhere really. It could go here, 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 or over there. It's not a problem. And same with the red. I'll start with the video and I was going to poke it through the hole, turn the board over, bend it like it's a component. I'm just going to wire this in and just get it to stay. There we go. We'll do the same with the, uh, the sound. It is a little bit fiddly this. And again, you don't have to do this. You could do it how we built the other one with BNC connectors. That's not a problem. Uh, it's just this gives me a little bit of flexibility later on. And then finally we just need to ground it, which means we just literally can just wire into one of these, no problem. So if I just put a little bit of uh, flux down on that. Tin it, so we just put a bit of solder on the pad like that. Oops. Try not to move the whole thing. There we are, so that's on there. That should now work as video, and it should now work to these two sockets here. Uh, one final thing to do then is to put our, well, actually two final things to do. First of all, we need to put our uh, programmed 308P chip in. Again, making sure all the legs are relatively straight. Just check the other side. Yep, that's looking okay. Okay, that has gone in all right. And now I actually need to put some jumpers in. Uh, we've got to make some connections, and that's why we put the jumper pins in, but we actually now need to put the connecting jumpers. So, you can buy these in quite large quantities. These are just little plastic jumpers. And they normally go with the flat end at the bottom. So the jumpers we need to jump, we need to jump this one here as a priority. We need to jump the sound. If we want the sound of the speaker, we put this one into the uh, left position. So uh, new for revision for this board, the final jumper is to select video. So if you are in America, Canada, Mexico, uh, you want to use NTSC analog video. That's over here on the right. It's actually labeled here NTSC, tiny little print, but it's there. And on the other side is PAL, if you're anywhere else in the world, including me here in Europe. So I'm going to select 
pal, which means I'm going to put the jumper over to the left. So we are so close to doing an electrical test of this board. I'm just going to run over the back with uh, soldering on again because there's a couple of pins I'm not happy with. And we don't want things not to work purely because of uh, poor connections. So I'm just going to do that quickly. And then we may go for the very first power op just to see what actually happens. Fingers crossed. Okay, we're back. I just had to take a brief tea break there, but we're back. So the board is now ready. I have gone over it and just done up any soldering joints. Uh, as I said, really difficult to solder on camera correctly. Uh, we're now going to do a power test. So nothing else is connected. It's just going to be the board. So as with all my tiny base computers, we're going to use an Apple iPhone charger. You just want something with your native mains voltage one side and 5 volt USB the other. And we'll use a USB A to mini USB cable for this. So we'll just plug into the iPhone charger. That'll go off into the mains power off at the moment and we'll plug the other end into the nano board there we go I always get really nervous when this is a first time power up so this board is going to be switched on now for the very first time we know the chip is good and we know the Arduino is good oh I'm nervous okay nothing else is connected uh, we haven't put the LED in uh, we'll still get lights here though, so let's just see what happens. Let's power up and see if there's any obvious problems. Okay, looking really good. No sign of smoke or anything. I'm just going to focus on the activity lights here. Now if I hit reset, you can see a little bit of activity on the TX diode. Let's do that again. There you are, just the flash. Uh, that shows it is working and putting stuff through serial. So let's just power off. And I've got the video here. Uh, I do have a composite signals, so we'll plug that goes into black, yellow to black, and we'll put some sound in over here. Um, I need to change the jumper for the sound from the buzzer, which we haven't tested yet. So I might need to get a pair of pliers on it. There we go. I'm going to put that over for the external speaker. Uh, we'll plug a keyboard in, USB keyboard in, in a minute. It's not USB, it's PS2 on these, but we use the USB socket and then we use the PS2 protocol that's present on most PC compatible keyboards. Uh, let me reposition the camera. We'll plug it into the TV and we'll do a second power up. And let's see if we actually get any video on screen. Okay, there is cables everywhere. <laughs> this one here is actually the power lead for the device. It's just down here off camera. Uh, let's just turn on the TV. So I've got this set up for power, which is what I want. Okay, let's power up, see what happens. Oh, look at that, it's come up. That's fantastic. So. If I now take the jumper, which I know you can't see, I'm going to take the jumper off the uh, video side. So pal, set it to NTSC and hit reset. It does. That's NTSC mode. It has a slightly stretched picture. If I take the jumper off and put it back and reset. There we are. Back to pal. Okay, so with the system still running, let's put in a USB keyboard. Okay, that seems to have come up, and there we go. Memory in the system, that's fine. 555 bytes is fine, there is a program in this already. Uh, let's just try the sound. Tone. Okay, that worked. That worked all right. Um, let's put that jumper back. There's a sound jumper going back on the other side, and let's retype the command. There we go, that's out the buzzer. Oh, that's fantastic. So this, I think, is working. Let's do a reset. Yes, I think this system is actually working. So, wow, that means the boards will be ready to go out to all the patrons who support me. 
and uh, you'll be able to order your own clone boards from PCB Go Go. So there we are, a successful first time build. A little bit nervous, but we got there, and I can't be more happy with the results. So, as already mentioned in the video, if you would like to get hold of your own version of the PCB, you need to join our free dollar Patreon. It's the general downloads and support Patreon. Uh, the link for that is in the description to this video. From there, you have the tiny basic computers toolkit, download it, you'll find the PCBs in a folder and there'll be a Gerber zip file. No need to unzip it, just head over to pcbgogo.com. The affiliate link is in the description to this video. Uh, sign up for account if you haven't done already, it's free to sign up. And then it's a simple case of drag and drop, a couple of settings, your postage and payment details, and you should have PCBs with you within two weeks. Shipping pending, of course. If you haven't done already and want to find the downloads or the schematics for any of the series so far, you can do so by joining our Facebook group. It's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash WFS Tiny Basic. Uh, there you'll find our ever growing community of Tiny Basic computer builders, and I'm hoping that will grow. And I also have lots more planned right here on the channel. We've really only touched the tip of the iceberg of what we can do, not only with Tiny Basic computers, but with a wider scope of new build electronics projects going forward. So if you haven't done already, don't miss out on anything. Do make sure you like and subscribe. You can also click that notification bell, which will let you know when I upload any new stuff. I really hope I might see you in Cambridge in October. Fingers crossed. Let's see how that goes. But as always, thank you so much for your company. If you haven't done already, please do like and subscribe and I will see you real soon right here on the channel. Until next time, bye for now.